Alright, welcome back to We Play Games. I'm Walker, and here we are about to discuss the medieval era cultures tier list in Humankind. But before we jump in on our medieval era cultures, I do think that it's important that we contextualize things. Because that's context is really important in every culture moving forward. Some cultures, generally speaking in the ancient and classical era, are just a lot better than others, simply because the most important thing I think in the beginning of the game is to get that snowballing going. This is a 4x game after all, and so having access to more resources is, generally speaking, a lot more useful than anything else. You need to understand that a tier list is less about take this one and not that one, and more about which cultures are generally strong and which cultures are generally weak. And for that matter, which cultures are more easily made powerful. And so the tier list here, you need to understand it's not that some cultures are good, some cultures are bad, but simply that some cultures are more commonly good and some are more commonly bad. So let's also briefly discuss the classical era. You can see here that we've conquered our entire continent. That's something that we were able to do during the classical era on this normal sized map with four continents, simply because we only had one other neighbor and during the ancient era we took their capital and so that sent them way back into the stone age so it was super easy to finish them off in the classical era. In the classical era, depending on the map that you're playing on, you might not have conquered your entire continent, but you probably will. We, for instance, definitely could have conquered like 50% more space without any real issue. We had tons of extra influence just kind of sitting around and we could have easily had a much bigger army to fight another strong civilization. But you do need to prioritize going wide. Going wide is generally very, very valuable simply because A, outposts are competitive, but also because of the nature of exploitation, right? The outposts in question are going to exploit the main resources around them, whereas every district that you build is generally speaking going to exploit only specific resources. And so what that means is maker's quarters, farmer's quarters, even emblematic districts, generally speaking, aren't as powerful as just getting a good outpost down. But good outposts are on land, meh outposts are on islands. Islands, generally speaking, have very, very low productivity out of the, the territory near them. And so going wide does hit a cap. That's kind of why the medieval era is going to be so complicated. I'm going to expect that you understand the basics of each star, but if there's something that's different about them, and in the medieval era there are a couple of things that are different, we'll discuss them in context. So let's begin by discussing the Aztecs. As I said, there are some things that are a little different in context. Here, for the uh, militarist star in the medieval era and moving forward, the militarist bonus war support is actually really important. You can get high war support from crises with your political opponents if you, if you want to. Ultimately, you can create the situation for high war support if you want it, but this will guarantee it, and high war support in the medieval era means that wars aren't going to just net you a lot of extra gold, which is generally what you get in the ancient and classical era when you're fighting people, but also extra cities or outposts because of the way peace resolution works, right? You need war support in order to ensure that you can get maximum value out of your wars, and if you can take two or three cities in one war, that's a lot better than just taking one city and a bunch of gold. So militarists, generally better. Also on Aztecs, we have one of the strongest traits here for militarist uh, affinity stars. Plus two land movement speed and minus 20% unit industry cost is a phenomenal strength bonus. Extra land movement speed isn't just useful on the overmap, moving troops around, but also really useful in combat. Because of the way combat works in humankind, positioning and terrain is really, really important, and land movement speed allows you to way more easily get good positioning. And so this is a huge combat bonus, even though it doesn't necessarily say like plus two strength. And minus 20% unit industry cost is phenomenal, simply because the more troops that you have on the field, the easier it'll be for you to cycle troops through combat. It'll also allow you to get good surrounds on your opponents. In terms of like military abilities, this is one of the strongest. It's probably not as strong as Rome's, but it's definitely up there. 
So what else do the Aztecs have? They have this emblematic district, Sacrificial Altar. I like Faith. I think Faith, generally speaking, is a very powerful ability simply because this is something that's going to give you control over the growth of your society in a non-random way. The more faith you have, the faster you'll be able to hit these higher tier bonuses. But also, the by hitting the higher tier bonuses and securing them for yourself, you won't lose out on the really strong ones to your opponents. And so, faith, very, very powerful. I think it's one of the best things to find on your emblematic districts. And of course, the other thing that I think is really powerful to find on your emblematic district is influence. And hey, the Aztecs have that too. They do have influence per adjacent district, and so generally speaking, the sacrificial altar benefits a lot more from having a well-built up tall society than some of the other things, which are just like, you know, plus flat amount of influence. But plus two influence per adjacent district can be quite a lot. And the sacrificial altar also gives you uh, just a flat 10 stability, which is also really good, because stability, although there are lots of different ways to get stability in humankind, specifically you can get it from garrisons, from luxury goods, from troops garrisoned in, in your cities, um, being able to get it off of your emblematic districts is sort of like a, a little influence bonus too, simply because pops living in high stability cities are also going to net you extra influence. So Sacrificial Altar in terms of its its district ability is very good. But unfortunately for the Aztecs, although they are a militarist culture, their emblematic unit I don't think is very good. Jaguar warriors have 35 strength, which puts them pretty far behind a lot of their competitors here in the medieval era. They do have fervor though, which means that if you can give them extra strength bonuses, then they can fight really effectively in a long drawn out combat. But because of the lower strength that they have, they will take more damage. And so you need to make sure that if you're going to be using the Aztecs to go on a conquering spree, that your Jaguar warriors have bonuses to their strength, either coming from their faith or coming from combat bonuses on your cultures in the ancient or classical era. So what does all of this mean for the Aztecs? They have a phenomenal, phenomenal trait when it comes to conducting warfare that's great throughout the entire game, not just with themselves. And they also have a pretty strong emblematic district, but their emblematic unit, I think, is mostly ignorable, um, and so you have to judge it based off of two-thirds of a culture, more or less. And I think for that reason, I'm gonna put them as a high B, maybe a low A. They're somewhere in that range. They are very good at doing what they do, which is waging war, but you don't wanna be utilizing their Jack Warriors as much as you would hope to. Given that they're a militarist, I think the fact that their emblematic unit is bad draws them down. Up next, we have the Byzantines, which are a merchant affinity. This is another thing that kind of has changed in the context of the medieval era, just as the militarist star has gotten a little better, the merchant star has gotten way better. Because here in the medieval era, and moving forward, there's actually a civic that allows you to spend money instead of influence to claim, attach, and merge territories. It doesn't break you free from influence entirely because you're still going to need influence to make cities and stuff, but it drastically reduces a society's dependence on influence and dramatically increases the value of money in your society. And so in the medieval era and all eras forward, money is just more useful. But of course, the Merchant Star does still require lots of trade partners to really make good value out of. You do have the ability to spend influence for tons of money using Power Investor, and you have the ability to make money selling resources to other trade partners. But basically, the Merchant Star requires two or more friendly trade partners to really get good value out of. And so anytime I see a Merchant Star, I look for something here that can pay me out in the event that uh, we don't have any trade partners because we ate them all. And unfortunately for the Byzantines, they kind of don't have that. So their trait plus 5% money per alliance on all cities, it looks good because percent bonuses are generally speaking stronger than flat bonuses as the game goes on. But 5% money per alliance is a lot of hoops that you have to jump through for a relatively low payout. And it also doesn't help you in the event that you've eaten all of your friends. So this is sort of a, a highly specialized trait that ultimately isn't very good. The emblematic district is okay. 
it's also highly specialized, plus 25 money per adjacent horse deposit. Here on this map, you can see that we would have one, two, three horse deposits. We would get 75 extra money. That's not bad, right? That's a lot of extra cash that we would get off of the Hippodromo. It's just money. This doesn't get us any more influence. It doesn't get us any more faith. It doesn't even get us any more industry or science or food. It's very powerful in a specific context, right? Because horses are a great resource. They help you get more food out of some of your infrastructure. But ultimately, I think that having a, a district that doesn't fix any problems for you isn't very good. And also, unfortunately for the Byzantine, the Varangian guards with their honor code preventing your army from retreating, as well as only 38 strength and no sort of combat bonuses beyond just that 38 strength, means that I think the Varangian guards ultimately are kind of spooky to use. 38 strength is a lot of strength on a, a heavy infantry, no doubt, but it also means that you need to have a superior army to your opponents or your armies might get completely stack wiped, right? You can get TPK'd very easily if you have Varangian guards and you get caught out in a position where your army gets uh, destroyed piecemeal. So I think the Byzantines, unfortunately, are gonna have to be our a D tier culture here. They, even though money is way, way stronger in the medieval era, they don't help you in the event that you've gone wide and they punish you pretty severely in the event that you go up against an opponent that happens to have military superiority locally. So they're dangerous to use and can really cause a lot of problems for you. I would avoid the Byzantines except under specific circumstances. Kind of on the same note, we have the English. So the English have agrarian this is greener pastures is kind of a nonsense ability that lets you spend influence to steal tiny amounts of pops. You can just steal pops by conquering people's cities. That's fine. That's generally better than stealing them one at a time. But I think that unfortunately for the English, the rest of their package doesn't really fix up how bad uh, agrarian is in the medieval era and moving forward. So their trait serfs labor plus seven food per number of attached territories on city or outpost. Generally speaking, in the ancient, medieval, and classical eras, you're going to have one to three territories on each city, so that's seven to twenty-one food. You can just average it out and pretend like it's just a flat fourteen food per city. That's okay. That's sort of like a good free farmer's quarter that doesn't increase the cost of future districts. But that's nothing crazy, right? That's not minus twenty percent on industry cost for, for units or anything like that. And the, considering that this is the thing that you don't have to invest any resources into in order to get value out of, I like having a really good trait. And this one is pretty meh. The English do have a really, really interesting emblematic district though. The Stronghold is a Hamlet-like ability in that it's a resource exploitation that doesn't need to be built adjacent to anything because it's a garrison and it exploits food. So it's not a perfect resource exploitation, right? Ideally you get food and industry or at least industry, but food is not bad. And this also gives you some pretty hilarious bonuses when it comes to using the stronghold as a garrison. Plus 20 district fortification is really nice, but this is also plus two attack range. If it has a ranged attack, increases range for two for ranged units standing on it and extra vision range so that way you can actually see into your enemies as well as a big combat strength bonus but all of those bonuses really are good bonuses when you're defending and in humankind most of the time you don't want to be fighting defensive wars you want to be fighting offensive wars that'll conquer territory and so most of the bonuses here for the stronghold are context dependent on you being in a bad situation. The fact that it is a hamlet means that it's not a terrible emblematic district, but I do wish that it had some way to help us in the event that we were going to be fighting in an enemy area, right? If this eagle-eyed bonus, for instance, were a smaller bonus, but applied to every unit recruited, then that would be a lot stronger. The English do get access to longbowmen, which is pretty funny. Four range and indirect fire means that you can use longbowmen plus just like a swarm of chaff to, to stick in front of them to really slaughter your opponents. You can just take out the enemy ranged units, which generally speaking are gonna have a lower strength, therefore 
take more damage from ranged attacks, and then just pile into the enemies as, as you see fit. And of course, four range does interact very favorably with Stronghold. You can have some insanely long-ranged units if you want them. So out of all of the parts of the English package here, I actually think that the Longbowmen are by far and away the strongest part of the package. So it just comes down to how much do you value the strategic options that English gives you. I think that this being a Hamlet means that the English aren't awful, and they do have a pretty strong unique unit. Um, so I think that C rank makes sense for the English. If the Stronghold wasn't a, a Hamlet, then they would be a pretty obvious D. But because the, the Stronghold gets you food, I don't think that they can be a D rank. I think they're okay. Up next, we have the Franks. So we've talked a lot about Estite. Generally speaking, when you run out of clay, influence does start to drop off in terms of value, but it's never bad because influence is the thing that you need in order to get access to unclaimed wonders. But of course, you can also use influence in the, the mid to late game sort of as a stand-in for, for money or for industry by detaching territories and then building harbors using that influence. So here, for instance, we could finish out this star by just building the stupa with gold, which, hey, we'll probably do that anyway. But we can also spend influence by detaching this territory, building a harbor, hey, that's 20 food, and then turning around and reattaching the outpost. And now we have a harbor generating 20 food for us for a very, very tiny amount of influence. So influence, although it is less useful in the mid to late game, it never stops being useful. And at a certain point, you're actually gonna be able to start spending influence to build forests. So basically influence always good. And of course, if there's land near you, then influence is just amazing. Crown lands is a plus 10% influence bonus and it's a flat 10%. You don't have to jump through any hoops um, and that makes it just a lot stronger than the Byzantine bonus. This is equivalent to having two alliances, which is easier said than done and doesn't punish you for having devoured all of your friends. So this is a, a phenomenal trait that's gonna only get better as the game goes on. The only real downside, of course, is that a lot of your influence isn't gonna necessarily be coming from natural production, but rather from your cultural blitz affinity action. And so Crown Lands isn't as good as it looks on the surface, but it's never a bad thing and sets you up well for the, uh, the later eras by help hopefully helping you break free from Estite addiction. The Franks also have an emblematic district that is frighteningly close to the stupa out of the Morians in that it gets you faith, it gets you science, it gets you influence. Hey, that's all a familiar package there. And I loved that district in the classical era. And I hope it doesn't surprise you that I love the same district in the medieval era. Those are all great resources that you're getting out of the scriptorium. And I think generally speaking, even though this is only plus two influence per adjacent research quarter, it's not too hard to set yourself up where you can build scriptoriums next to each other at the intersection of different territories. And so it's not too hard to get really, really good value out of these guys. Great, great district. Their emblematic unit is crazy expensive. Two horses, two iron, chivalry technology. But in exchange for having that insanely expensive uh, resource and technological and setup requirement, these things are powerhouses. 39 strength is just a lot. Plus they have heavy charge, so they get extra combat strength when, when they have to move extra spaces to attack people. Really the only downside here is because they are heavy cavalry, they can't help you in sieges unless you have siege weapons, but they can still help you by flanking enemy cities and moving around and hopefully drawing the attention of the defenders. And six movement on a cavalry, of course, means that you can just thread your way through any sort of land battle and slaughter enemy units. These are just phenomenal emblematic units that only require a little bit of support. If you're going to be using these to take cities, make sure you have siege weapons, but hey, that's not that hard. Once you once you have the, the tech for chivalry and the ability to drop hamlets down, you should have so many resources that getting siege weapons isn't a problem. Franks, easy S tier. Obviously, with the asterisk that influence is going down as the game goes on, but these guys are just bangers. All right, up next we have the Ghanians. The Ghanians are another merchant affinity uh, culture, and so of course they are going to benefit from having access to trade partners, but fortunately their trait 
helps them break free from having trade partners. Plus five money per access to resources is something that benefits you a lot if you're trading, but also benefits you a lot if you've just like murder hoboed all of your friends and now you have control over all of the resources locally. This is just an outrageous amount of gold that we would get without having having done anything other than the natural progression of ancient and classical era, which is conquering stuff. And so this is a really great merchant ability, one that really stands in contrast to a lot of the other ones, because this one doesn't necessarily require that you follow the same sort of normal diplomatic, let's all be friends goal of the merchant star. This is a, just a great, great trait. Luxury markets, on the other hand, are really just sort of market quarters plus. Unlike the Byzantines, who get tons of extra resources from having access to horses, Luxury Market is almost a carbon copy of a market quarter, except it does get you a little bit of extra money, plus money per number of trade routes, so it's not a bad market quarter, it's a really good market quarter, but it's almost exactly just a normal market quarter. It doesn't get you influence, it doesn't get you faith, doesn't get you any other resources other than money, and so I don't think you need to put too much emphasis on luxury markets. Maharists are alright. They are 35 strength, which I did count as a pretty meaningful penalty for Jaguar Warriors, but unlike Jaguar Warriors, which are generally speaking supposed to be like the bulk of your army, Maharists are not. Maharists, you want to have like maybe one or two in an army, use them as anti-cavalry, but then that frees up the rest of your army to not have to be pikes, because pikes and halberdiers, spearmen, any of the anti-cavalry infantry, generally speaking, get crunked by the infantry that are just good at other infantry fights, like heavy infantry, but in turn usually get ridden down by heavy cavalry. Maharists, on the other hand, because of their anti-cavalry bonus, as well as the cavalry ability to ignore enemy zones of control and their six movement, if you use these guys well in combat, you can specifically pick off the enemy cavalry, then pick off their ranged, all the while your front line is just dominating. So don't over-specialize in these, don't build tons of them, but if you have one or two, they're actually really good supplemental units. If it wasn't for the fact that you could spend money to go wide, then the Ghanians would actually be pretty bad, but now in the medieval era, that context means that the Ghanians are way stronger. I think the Ghanians are a B tier still, simply because their emblematic district is very whatever, and the Maharists, although they're strong, they are something you can't just build 15 of and feel good with, but their trait is A+. Plus. If if the rest of the, the Ghanaian package were as good as their trait, these guys would be easy A or S tier, but if you have a lot of trade partners or whatever, these guys still, generally speaking, are better than the Byzantines by a pretty wide margin. So don't be embarrassed playing the Ghanaians, they're, they're pretty strong. On the other hand, you probably should be embarrassed if you're playing the Khmer, just because these guys are disgustingly powerful. Um, these have been one of the strongest cultures in the game since 1.0 and remain as such. So the Khmer Builder Affinity, I don't care that much about this. Land Razor is okay moving further into the game because it gives you the ability to specialize one city into full industry mode. That's kind of a big problem when you only have one city, but if you have four or five, then turning one city over to just big build doesn't cost you your ability to make technological progress nearly as much. Their bonus here, plus three industry on maker's quarters, is a flat bonus, but it's a flat scaling bonus, and that's never a bad thing, right? And it does pay you out for later on in the game, or earlier on in the game, taking emblematic districts that count as maker's quarters. Speaking of emblematic districts, the Beret is probably the best emblematic district in the game, and the reason that the Khmer are so outrageously good, because these things count as both maker's quarters and farmer's quarters, and they give you plus five food, and they give you plus four industry per adjacent river. So what that means, of course, is that the Khmer definitely benefit a lot from having access to rivers. That means that they are a little context dependent upon the nature of the society that they are coming out of, as well as the nature of the map that they're playing on. But here, for instance, because we managed to snag the Harappans in the ancient era, we actually have even more river districts than we would normally because the canal network counts as a river. 
And so this beret is going to just add dozens of industry for each one that we plop down, as well as just an outrageous amount of food. This district is is so good that it's going to make you crazy. And hey, they have a pretty solid emblematic unit as well. It's expensive in that it does require military architecture, which is a relatively deep technology. But whatever, it's a 38 strength ranged unit that also has three range, which isn't embarrassing, and ignores penalties from fighting in melee. These things are really expensive in terms of their total industry, so you don't want to have thousands of them simply because you can't afford them, but uh, berets will help you afford them more than you'd think. I think that the Khmer are contextually one of the strongest, if not the strongest, in the game. I think that, generally speaking, the Khmer are usually going to be a little stronger than the Franks, but it does depend on your map, right? On this map in particular, the Khmer are going to be way, way better, but if there was a giant swath of uncolonized territory over here, then I'd need a lot more influence. But you, you just, you're only ever going to be embarrassed taking the Khmer simply because they're so good that, that they're going to make everybody else look bad. Up next we have the Mississippians, which are sort of like the weird brother of the Khmer. They're also a builder, and they're also a builder that specifically utilizes rivers a lot. But unlike the Khmer, who have a flat bonus to Maker's Quarters, this flowing waters trait really just goes crazy at giving you bonuses from rivers. You'd think that would necessarily mean that I that I would recommend taking the Mississippians if you always have rivers available to you, like if you were playing the Harappans, but you do need to understand that the Khmer industry on Maker's Quarters, while being more specialized and therefore more narrow, it is something that scales better, because there's a finite amount of river in the world, whereas there's kind of an infinite amount of Maker's Quarters in the world. So this is a good trait, but it is a trait that is geography dependent. Sacred Mound is a really weird one though. This is minus 50% industry cost reduction of adjacent districts. So you can't build this as a hamlet. It does need to be built adjacent to something. Therefore, you can't get the massive industry cost reduction on everything. But minus 50% industry cost is a huge, huge savings because of the way district costs increase as you have more and more districts on those cities. So Sacred Mound, really, really powerful if you're trying to just go as tall as possible and build as many districts as possible. It also is really helpful if you have other things that are going to help you reduce the cost of your districts. Like if you took Egyptians earlier on, or if you took pyramids or if you took both, then you can turn Sacred Mound into a disgusting amount of districts really, really fast. And hey, it even gives you a nice little bonus on religious districts, plus three faith, plus three industry. But that's kind of all it does. It doesn't give you the same sort of like explosive growth that the Khmer Beret does. This doesn't give you any influence or faith directly, but because food gives you pops and pops give you influence, this does kind of give you influence, whereas this very much doesn't. But minus 50% industry cost is like one of the best go tall modifiers in the game, and so these things are really, really strong. And it does exploit two different kinds of resources. It's just that instead of it being food and industry, it's industry and money, which is considerably worse. Cahokia's raiders are a little weird. They are, of course, one extra strength versus the jaguar warriors, and so they aren't as bad, but you also don't get plus two movement versus the Aztecs. And so unfortunately, Cahokia raiders are, are just not very good. The raiders' ardor ability is nice if you can find huge battles, and they're also really good if you're punching down. But they're not as useful if you're punching up, and Fervor, I think, generally speaking, is a stronger ability than Raider's Ardor, and so Cahokia Raiders, just as the Jaguar Warriors were just sort of a drag on the Aztec package, I think the Raiders here are a drag on the Mississippian package. So how are we going to rate the, the Mississippians? They're extremely context-dependent in that they get the most value out of having access to lots of rivers, and they also get lots of value out of being able to go tall as opposed to going wide, but what they do when they are going tall, that minus 50% industry cost reduction, is one of the biggest bonuses in the game that you're going to find, and so I think it, it would be inappropriate for us to put them really, really low. I think the Mississippians are kind of a, a B tier 
but they're a B tier with a huge delta. The more industry cost reduction stacking on districts that you do, the stronger the Mississippians become. So if the Mississippians are all on their own, you don't have pyramids, you don't have Egyptians, I think they're a low B. If you have either of those, then they're probably a, an A. If you have both of those and lots of, and lots of rivers, then they're probably an S tier. But I think with the general setup costs for the Mississippians, somewhere in the B makes sense. The Mongols, F in the chat for the Mongols, or M in the chat for the Mongols. The Mongols, once upon a time, were pretty good. Um, they used to have the ability to fight people in order to get food, in order to multiply, in the same way that the Huns and the Bantu used to be able to do that. But now all of those nomad units gather food on the map through accessing special discoveries and the food growth they get is so slow that it's it really doesn't work anymore i think that if the mongol hordes could grow faster then the mongols generally would be pretty good but they can't evolve outposts into cities vassalize cost is okay i guess but you're not going to have too much issue vassalizing your opponents and because the Orda prevents you from attaching outposts to your cities, I think that the Mongols right now kind of are in a really bad place. They don't, they don't have anything going for them other than the war support equilibrium value, which that's good, but not enough to make me interested in taking these guys. So the real question for the Mongols is, are they better or worse than the Byzantines? I think because the pop growth on on Mongol hordes is so slow right now, they take an outrageous amount of moving around the map just to get one extra unit, and because they don't have any sort of real scaling at the moment, I think think they're probably one of the worst in the era. Up next we have the Norsemen. The Norsemen are another militarist star, so again if you're going to be fighting people this extra war support is pretty helpful. But they also have a really interesting trait. Plus two combat strength is nice uh, on naval transport or naval units, but plus three movement is an awful lot. And so depending on the nature of the map, plus three naval movement for naval transport is usually I think stronger than plus two movement speed on land units, unless you're playing on like a Pangea, you're ultimately going to need to be able to move your troops around your map a lot faster. And plus three naval movement speed, when the base movement speed on naval transports is two, means that these guys are going to be moving way, way faster. And for that matter, the Norsemen aren't just going to be moving way, way faster versus a normal transport, they're going to be getting plus three movement on the longship. So the longship, their emblematic unit, it's not the same sort of normal emblematic unit, which is just extra strength. This is a naval transport, but it's a naval transport that has three base movement speed and ignores penalties from deep water. So normally in the medieval era, it's going to be dangerous to cross into deep water, ultimately your troops are going to die out there if they're on deep water for too long. But long ships, they don't care about that. If you need to go wide and you have lots of ocean near you, then the Norsemen are kind of unparalleled. The only thing that comes close to it are the Swahili, but even the Swahili themselves still have problems um, standing in ocean tiles for a long time. The Noust emblematic district that they have access to is mostly just a regular harbor, but it's a regular harbor that gets you tons of extra food, and tons of extra food on coastal waters or lakes. So it's not even a harbor that drops off considerably if you're not playing on islands. It's one that gets you lots of extra food and therefore great value, and as we demonstrated, you can spend influence to build harbors on your excess territories. So anything like that is actually really, really strong when it comes to, to leveraging influence. So how do we think about the Norsemen? Well, unfortunately, they don't have an emblematic unit that lets them bully people, but they do have an emblematic unit that lets them explore. They don't have a district that gets them lots of influence and lots of faith and lots of stability, but they do have an emblematic district that lets them spend extra influence to grow. So how should you approach the Norsemen? I think the Norsemen are emblematic of the medieval era generally, where a lot of their strength is context dependent. These guys benefit a lot from being able to leverage their influence on their existing districts. They're 
real bonus is this trait. If you're going to be moving troops around on the map, especially on the map on oceans, the Norsemen are probably the best in the game. And unlike the other militarists, the Mongols and the Aztecs, they don't have any real penalties. And so if you're going to be fighting people in the medieval era, I think the Norsemen are actually one of the better options. The fact that they don't get any sort of production bonuses means it'd be hard to put them ahead of the Aztecs on a on normal map, but on a map where they have access to lots and lots of water to move around on, I think they're, they would be a pretty easy A tier. But I think on an average map, they're probably somewhere around here. Up next, we have the Swahili. Swahili are another merchant affinity. They're a merchant affinity that also gets tons of extra stability on harbors. And so if you have access to the coast, the Swahili can transform that coast into lots of extra stability. And lots of extra stability coming from harbors means that you can easily throw extra harbors down on your districts and then reattach them, which is helpful, but the real bonus I think that they get access to is this Bandari, plus three money per number of unique type of resources on a harbor that you can plop down for a tiny amount of influence and a harbor that's going to get you a lot of extra stability means that Swahili, even if they don't have access to like a huge coast, as long as they have access to any water at all, I think are just phenomenal because this is a big payout in terms of having gone tall. And it also counts as a farmer's quarter and a market quarter for future and previous payouts. And the Metepe, sort of like the longship out of the Norsemen, is a really nice little bonus. And importantly, unlike the, the longship, which requires seafaring mastery and therefore can come kind of late into the medieval era, if in the medieval era at all, depending on how much technology you have, this is available immediately. And the four movement, it means that you're going to be able to move across the map very, very quickly. So I think that Swahili actually is my choice for the, the strongest merchant affinity here in the medieval era. It is a little less money in comparison to the Ghanians most of the time, but because harbors are so, so good with access to a little bit of extra influence, I think the Swahili actually get an A from me. Um, if these guys were in an earlier era where you couldn't use money to go wide, then obviously they'd be a little worse. But I think the Swahili are actually very good. So up next we have the Taino. The Taino are an agrarian star that's mostly whatever, not a great ability. But unlike the English, which had kind of a question mark ability here, the Zemis worship plus five food per number of territories in your sphere is way better than plus seven food per number of attached territories. This is an outrageous amount of food. And so if you are in a position where you can actually leverage tons and tons and tons of food, which generally speaking you are, then the Taino are actually just, they're really good based off of this, tr this trait alone. But unfortunately for the Taino, the rest of their package is kind of questionable. The Bete isn't bad, plus 10 stability, plus 10 influence on a settled city. Neither of those are bad bonuses out of an emblematic district, and plus 10 influence is actually quite a lot, and on a settled city isn't a huge number of jump hoops that you have to jump through. And hey, you get, you get plus 10 stability too, but it doesn't really give you anything else, and so it's a question of have you set yourself up where you can afford to build these Bete without setting the rest of your industry back. I think generally speaking you can, and so I think this is a pretty strong emblematic district as well, but it, it is a setup cost where you do need lots of industry in order to be able to make good use of it, and you need a reasonable amount of stability, because if you're not on a settled city, then obviously Bate is just a, a lot worse, but hopefully you're trading for luxuries or have just conquered your way to all of the luxuries. Byra Hunter isn't bad, it is lower strength than the Longbowman out of the English, but Canoe Fighters is actually pretty sweet, like you get minus three strength if you're on a river normally, and this also allows you to attack, attack other units without having a clear line of sight, which is another nice big bonus to the military strength of your ranged units. Of course at 31 strength in the medieval era, like other ranged units during this, this time period, they are not the be all end all for building a big strong army, but these are very, very flexible and useful ranged units. I think the Taino overall are a, just a much better version of the, the English, but it does kind of require you to be able to spend tons of food and only tons of food. So they're a C rank, 
I think, but they're a C rank that's much better than the C rank here out of English. The only reason that the English are here, of course, is that their stronghold is a hamlet, whereas the Taino are here at C, mostly because although their trait is phenomenal, everything else is kind of contextual. But if you need lots of food, and all you need is lots of food, then these guys are probably an A rank culture. They, they really provide if you just need to grow. So up next we have the Teutons. The Teutons are sort of a self-contained package. They're a really interesting society, but a society driven by faith. So their trait, spurred by faith, is plus one money per state religion follower, plus one science per state religion follower. That's not just within your own borders, that also looks at other societies. And so if you've managed to grow your faith wide and expand it into other societies, that can be very, very powerful. But even if you've just grown tall with your, your own faith, then this can get you lots of extra money in science. Like we have 53 followers right now, and so this would be 53 money, 53 science. That's almost as much money as we would get out of Ghanians, while also giving us an outrageous amount of extra science right up front without having to do any sort of infrastructure investment. So this is a really nice trait, but it is a flat bonus trait, so it's one of those things that starts good and then slows down as you go on. Their emblematic district, Kaiserdom, plus one faith per district, plus three influence, plus three faith per adjacent district, means that you can get just bananas amounts of faith out of this, and it counts as a Maker's Quarter. So this is a great emblematic district, but also just plus three influence flat bonus is always neat. And of course, more faith means more bonuses from Spurred by Faith, but also it means more bonuses for your Teutonic Knights. So Teutonic Knights are sort of like the bigger, badder brother of the Francie Milites out of the Franks. They are 39 strength, just as the Francie Milites are, but they have seven movement instead of the six out of the Franks. But then instead of having heavy charge, they get proselyte. This is bonus combat strength against enemies with different state religions. So ideally with the Teutonic Knights, you're going to be fighting in areas where you're going to be conquering enemy faiths. They are, of course, heavy cavalry with the same sort of asterisk that the Franks have, but because the Teutons are so focused on faith, you are going to probably be fighting against enemies with different state religions while also having some of your own religion followers within those realms. So that can be pretty helpful, actually, at expanding your faith by defeating enemies. So I think that the Teutons are actually pretty good, simply because they are so consistent at what they do. I think that generally speaking, the, the Teutons probably are around the other militarist star cultures, even though they are themselves not actually a militarist, simply because they are going to get access to more research, more money, um, and being able to utilize that faith that they get from their, their emblematic district will allow them to push into more advanced military faith bonuses. They're really scary when you can do faith stacking. So last but certainly not least, we have the Amayids. The Umayyads are only scientists here in the medieval era, which means that they, unless you're carrying over a science star from an earlier era, are your best bet to getting humanism. So when it comes to playing a scientist culture, you do need to be aware that there are that not all technologies are made the same. Some of them, like feudalism with plus one food on tile producing food, that's a really good one. Chivalry with access to hamlets, that's a really good one. But those are both available to societies normally in, in the medieval era. And the big bonus, of course, is being able to research one era ahead. And so if you're going to be taking the Amayids, the big bonus, one era ahead is humanism. Humanism gives you access to luxury manufactories with the plus 30 stability, plus they are a competitive resource. There's only one luxury manufactory for each luxury that you can build in the world. And so getting these luxury boosters down, it's a, a huge bonus in terms of powering your economy and your society up. And so if you can get down to humanism, then Umayyads are just a, an amazing society across the board based off of that one technology alone. And collective minds will help you get there, right? If you don't need industry and money because you're not super interested in building expensive districts that don't do anything for you, this can really supercharge your economy and just power through the important technologies. Which is good, because the rest of the Amayad package is pretty meh. The trait here, plus 5% science per alliance, is basically just the science version of the Byzantine bonus. It's like the Franks, but contextual and smaller. 
their emblematic district being plus five faith is nice. And of course, because it counts as two different kinds of buildings, a research quarter and a religious district, you can get some pretty interesting bonuses here. And of course, because some of these tenants, especially in the second tier and later, get you bonuses on religious districts in addition to maybe religious quarters as well, or research quarters as well, Amayids really do utilize faith very well. And their emblematic unit is pretty underwhelming, to be entirely honest. It's a 30 str 36 strength cavalry. Draining additional stability during sieges, though, means like literally nothing in this game, because most sieges are going to be resolved by you clicking besiege and the enemies inside clicking attack the besiegers and the siege as quickly as possible and then you just fight on the the map wipe out their army and move in on on one turn they're sort of like knights plus and they don't require iron which is okay but i think the the big bonus for the amayids is the ability to research humanism early but you know what that's that is on its own enough to make these guys an A-tier faction. I think, generally speaking, I would rather be playing Swahili simply because you're not going to be getting any sort of bonuses in terms of go wide, whereas Swahili can get lots of bonuses in going wide through the utilization of money and its civics, whereas Umayyads really are humanism or bust. But humanism's like one of the best technologies in the entire game, and these guys can get you there. So in the context of this specific game, I think we're going to go ahead and take the Khmer, but I think it really is context dependent. There are lots of different things that you can do in humankind, and I hope that these videos, uh, these tier list videos, kind of help solidify that for you. So there is one more culture that we haven't talked about, the Bulgarians, and it's simply because I don't own the DLC for it yet. It looks like an interesting package, right? Any sort of district that gives you access to influence is usually pretty good, and this is a lot of extra stability potentially. And this is a ranged mobile unit, and those are just a terrifying combination of, of abilities. And so I think the Bulgarians actually look like they, they would potentially be really scary. Plus five leverage against the defeated empire in a battle won without losing units sounds like a win more ability, but if you've got ranged mobile units, then it should be pretty easy to do. So let me know down below if you've played with the Bulgarians. Let me know if you disagree or if you agree with any of the, the decisions here in regards to this, this tier list. But like I said, it's a lot of context, and I think that understanding that really none of the societies, none of the cultures are bad, but some of them are generally better, is the real value of a, a tier list here in humankind. All right, that's, uh, that's Walker. Take care.